All right, well, a lot of this that I'm going to be talking about today, oh, went too back too far, comes from this web page. It's the SGE Basics. We use a scheduler called Sun Grid Engine, or SGE. It's the open source version of the stuff that came out a long time ago, if you guys have been used schedulers before, that kind of thing. Um, the command to submit jobs is QSUB. You can see up here, QSUB. What it does is it takes the command you give it and it runs it through our scheduler. The scheduler is a piece of software that best figures out how to get all the people as happy as we possibly can. We uh, schedule on a per core basis, so you can ask for a certain number of cores, a certain amount of RAM, and it'll say, okay, this many cores and this, many RAM, this much RAM has been spoken for on this machine, can I fit it there? If not, can I fit it there? This kind of thing. Um, once again, and we highlight this just about everywhere we go, BioCat will not magically make your program use multiple cores. Your program has to be written to support multi-threaded operations. So, we need to know how much memory you need, you need to know how many cores you need, and we have some advanced options there too, but we're, we're not going to go through many of those here today unless, we, unless I go through this a whole lot faster than I think I'm going to. So, let's just go ahead and create a file. I'm going to do this real time here. It's, I have two sessions open, I don't want that. There we are. I think I have it already set up here, don't I? Nope. What do I call it? My host. All right, I'm going to create a, create a file here called my host. And all this is going to do is this is going to find out what machine we're running on and come right back. So this, this will take all of you know, a couple of seconds to run on a machine. Come on. Typing on a keyboard that is not my own and it's throwing me off. Hostname. This is a command. Uh, if, if I run hostname on a on any machine, it'll just going to tell me what machine it's running on. Okay. So I'm going to write that. So now, if I look at this, it says. My host SH. Okay, this is what it looks like. Just running hostname. So if I run hostname right now, it says I'm on Selene, which is what the name of the head node. We have two head nodes, EOS and Selene, whichever one you log into, you might get one or the other. So that'll be if when you're first logged in there. Now, talked about permissions being tricky. This has to be uh, uh, executable. So I'm going to make this that file I just created executable. So, I'm, again, I didn't go through this part earlier because it would make your eyes glaze over and it's no fun to look at. But, this is the part I'm using to make it executable. So now I have my host SH, now it's in green, so I know it's executable. All right? So, how many cores do you think I'm going to need on this? One. How much memory do you think I'm going to need on this? A little bitty, bitty amount. Not even much. Um, the default on BayoCat is for one hour, one core, and one gig of RAM per core. 
that's going to fit well within our uh, parameters here. So I'm going to submit this to the scheduler with Q sub, and in the file we're running to file we're want wanting to submit. And then I'm actually going to, because it's probably going to run really fast, <laughs> see if it shows up that fast. Ah, darn it, went through too much. All right. Okay. So since I use the default, it's telling me you've not requested memory for this job. The default of one gig has been selected for you. That's it's going to tell you this whenever you don't, whenever you're using the defaults. Same thing for runtime. I've not never I haven't requested a runtime default of one hour. Uh, we don't get it as much as we used to. We used to uh, get the question a whole lot of, hey, my job ran for an hour and then it stopped. Why is that? Because you ran it, asked for an hour. You didn't, you didn't tell it a specific time limit, so it ran, for, it ran until it ran for an hour, and the scheduler said, hey, you already used your hour you asked for. Done. Uh, was Mark killable? Because it has a runtime left of less than 12 hours. We have... Uh, uh, several machines here that are owned by a particular group. Uh, the uh, entomology group bought a machine for us. Part of the deal is they bought it for us, we manage it for them. That works out kind of good for both of us. A part of that is, is that anytime they want to use it, they have priority access on it. So we'll kick off any jobs that aren't theirs so they can run theirs. But in return for that, whenever they're not using it, anybody else can use it. That's why we have jobs marked as killable. Anything, uh, if you mark a job as killable, means it can run on those nodes, which means it'll usually run a whole lot faster. It'll get started a whole lot faster because it can run anywhere. But you also understand that if they need it during the mean, meantime, they're going to kill your job and so their stuff can run. That's, we figure 12 hours is about the port cutover point there where if your job's under 12 hours, you're not going to care if it got killed and gets restarted because it's going to run again probably pretty quick anyway. Uh, if it's over 12 hours, you're going to be really frustrated that your job ran for so long and then you have no results out of it. You can force that with, you know, if you say, I'm, I need something to run for four days, but I don't care if it gets killed, I just want it to run quick, that's fine too. A lot of jobs do what's called self-checkpointing, which means that it stays at state every so often along the way. And so if it gets killed and restarted, you don't care because it'll just pick up where it left off, which is slick, but it doesn't, uh, so in that case, you might want to run a job killable. You don't want to keep, waste a whole lot of time, though. So this one does that. It's, it's telling you it, it, it uh, is using killable. So then it finally tells me that requested resources of this job, H underscore RT, is that's the hard run time of one hour. Memory is one gig. When you start submitting multiple uh, core jobs, You'll want to know that this is per core. We've had a lot of people that have requested an insane amount of memory per core because they thought it was per job. It's not for the whole job, it's per core. And it's in the killable. And then it says my job number, 2305517 has been submitted. So now I have a job that has gone into the queue as number 2305517. And if I look down here, the first thing I did is after after I did that is I told it as soon as you run as soon as you submit this, I want you to run a, a program called QStat. QStat is a monitoring program. It tells all the jobs that are sitting in here right now. This is this is this was as of a couple minutes the live look at the, of the queue, and you can see my job here at the bottom two three zero five five one seven. Generally speaking, the ones near the top are going to run first. The ones at the bottom are going to run last. However, since I had such a small job, I'm guessing mine's going to get kicked up here pretty quick. So. I'm going to do QStat. I'm going to look for my name. This is another Linuxism. Grep means show me any, any files it, with that line in it. So I'm saying grep. Kyle Hudson is saying, I'm going to take all this output and only show me the li a line in it if it has the word Kyle Hudson in it. It doesn't. That means my job is already finished, which is what I thought it would probably do. It went really fast. 
So now, back in my home directory, not, not where I was because I didn't tell it this, back in my home directory, I'm going to look through my files. I'm sorting it by time. The LRT is, is sorting it by time. And you see that I have two files out here. One's called myhost.sh, which is the name of the file I submitted, .e, 2305517. E stands for the error file. That's any errors that would have come out of this. 2305517 was my job number that it told me that I had at the beginning. And I have another one here called myhost.sh.o. That's the output, 2305517. So I always will create these two files, the error file and the output file. It tells me right here that the error file has a size zero, so I'm not going to show you what's in there because we already know that it's empty. If I do cat is, is basically show me what's inside the file. <laughs> I got, again, I'm using a lot of things here that we probably haven't gone over. I'm trying to, I'm trying to show you stuff without bugging you down the details and understanding that there's some details you're going to have to know somewhere along the way. Cat is just a, show me the output of the file. So I said, show me what's in this file. The, and it says elf 38. Told you we had four class, or uh, yeah, we have mages, we have elves, and we have heroes running right now. So that ran on elf 38. That was the name of the node that ran the job. So what it did is it took, the scheduler said, okay, I can fit your job right now on elf 38. And elf 38 said, okay, and it ran that file the myhost.sh that I put in there. Does that make sense? It's a very simple example, but good. This is actually going through pretty much the same things I have there. Now, I showed you the QStat shows what's on there. There's another one that actually QStat is very uh, tricky to get more than just basic information out of. So Dave over here wrote a program called KSTAT. And KSTAT kind of takes everything that QSTAT does and it makes it look pretty and easy to use. So what this does is this is, this is another way you can monitor your programs. You can go through here and look for your name or whatever. Um, any machine that is in red means it's not running. And we have a few of those right now. We just made some changes, and so we have several of them that are needing to be restarted and things like that. So it starts at the top with the elves. Elf 01, it has 16 cores, zero are used. Uh, it has 64 gigs on it, it's not using any, and the queue is disabled. Elf 2, on the other hand, has, again, this is one of the things that it's reporting wrong because of the changes we just made. But it says it's running six, normally it'll put up here, it should say 16 of 16 cores right now. This is the name of the job. If it was my job that I just ran, it would have said myhost.sh. That's the name of what I wrote on there. Um, and 16 cores, it's telling you how, much resource, how many resources are being used. And it goes through that and does that for every machine in here. It's a real good way of seeing how things are going. Anything in red is something you should pay attention to. I wonder why that one's 59.2 out of 64. Normally you see this, that, that if you've requested more memory, then, then, or you're using more memory than you requested, you'll see it red over here. This, the max VMMNA, means the program, program's not even running, so that means there's something wrong with that one. That's, so it'll say max VMMNA if you if you submit a job and it's only been running for five or ten minutes, then that's fine. It takes a while before the uh, SGD starts gathering statistics. But if it's longer than ten or twenty minutes, it's still showing that. It'll show it in red, and that's when you have to think there might be a problem. And if that's true, then you should contact us. In this case, it's been that job was running for a day, and it's clearly having trouble. So we need to look at that job or that note. And this is one thing Dave does is he looks at this on a regular basis and says, hey, something's wrong with what you did. Hey, that, you know, that, that kind of thing. He's, he's really good at staying on top of keeping things running as efficiently as possible by uh, 
by pointing these things out. Because right now, those eight cores are reserved for this job that isn't running. So that's why he's said that, because the sooner we can get that fixed, the sooner those eight cores can be used for something else more useful. So it goes through all the machines. Um, the ones in yellow means they're doing something strange. These are, these are a couple of machines that we've reserved for Dave so that he can do some testing, so that's why the yellow. Anything else here looks particularly interesting? Show, show some of the reserve nodes. Yeah, we're getting there. So anything with the name on the right side there, you can see some that are owned by uh, Big Lou, for example. Uh, up here. Over here. The ones that are in red, those are the ones that we talked about. There, that group has bought those machines. And so they have priority access on those on those nodes. Again, you see the red, they've asked for 32 gigs and they're and they're using 34. That's a quick way we can take a look and see who's using more than they should be. Anything else here? One of the best things about QSTAT is it does tell you how much memory you're actually using. Uh, with QSTAT, it's a little more difficult to look that up. And uh, so a lot of people ask us the question, well, I'm going to start running this. I have no clue how much memory to use. One of the best ways of handling that is to simply run the job and look. And it's using too much or more than you asked for killed off and increase it. So it's sometimes hard if you're not used to uh, a certain application to guess how much you're going to uh, need to start with. You have to do a little bit of trial and error. When it gets done down to the bottom of all the machines, then it shows the stuff that's sitting waiting in the queue, things that are waiting to, for the resources. So right now at the top of the queue is a one core job. This right here means this is a this is an array job, which is something not, Again, not going to go over today, but it's a way you can, if you're doing a lot of iterations of things, she apparently had, you know, 30,000 iterations of a, uh, probably a statistical package most likely. That's the way most of those are doing. So I need this set of inputs. I'm running the same program over again with this different set of inputs. You can do that all at once. So it's only one job sitting in there, but does it over and over again. Tell us what queue they're in what, or what group they're in. So you can kind of get a feel for what's ahead of you in line. Now, a lot of these, like I, if we had like my one core job that I submitted, it got to jump ahead of all these because all these were 16, 12s, or 4s, and it probably couldn't fit them on there anywhere. But it could fit my one core job in there pretty easily. It didn't need much, much, much uh, in the way of resources to do that. Tell us how much memory, how much time is available, or how much time they've requested for that. Somebody requested a whole bunch of jobs there. And again, it tells you if it's killable or not and any special requests that need to go on there. So that's essentially how you submit your first job. Questions on that? Has anybody here not submitted a job yet in Bayocat? Okay. Good. I, I'm glad to have you guys here then. That's, that means I didn't waste my time while I'm doing all this part. All right, um, another page I'm going to have you look at here, and this is linked a few places from our support site. This is Ganglia. Ganglia is the name of a program that uh, keeps track of a lot of stats for uh, historical data, that kind of thing. So you can see on here how many, what are, how much network traffic we've got, how much memory we've got right now, you can see uh, we have a total of 28 terabytes of RAM on our, on our nodes. How much CPU is being used. Temperature, you guys probably don't care much about. We care a lot about that. Uh, but the yellow line here is, uh, is basically how many, how many cores are in the queue right at any given time. So right now, 
it's sitting about 3,400. If you added up all those numbers from here, oh, went too far. If you added 1 plus 160 plus 32 plus 32 plus 16 plus 16, blah, 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 all the way down, you would come up with this number right here. Now 2.8K, so about 2,800 jobs, 2,800 cores are being requested. Right. But you can also see how the trend lines are. So you can see last hour it kind of moves down a little bit, last two hours kind of moving down a little bit, last four hours, last day. We started off the day at about, in the last 24 hours, at about 30,000 in the queue, and now we're about 2,800. And last week, you can see what's happened here. We've had people go along. They submitted a whole bunch of jobs, and then it works through the queue and gets them out of there. So I submitted a bunch of jobs, worked through the queue. Somebody submitted a few more, and now it's working its way down. So it should be clear again here fairly quick, just looking at trend lines. Those trend lines can help about as much as anything, is figuring out where, uh, where, where you stand in line. Because the question that people always want to know is, how long is it going to take? <laughs> and this will give you a good clue, especially, especially if you're uh, not a part of a working group. If, you have a, if you're part of a working group that's contributed to Baocat and you have those reserved nodes for your group, generally your time is going to be really quick. You only need to wait for the other people in your group if there's anybody ahead of you in line for your own group. So do we want to go through more advanced stuff? What do we want to do? Does that sound like a plan? Or is everybody still asleep and just ready to go home? <laughs> I don't know, Dave, how much will that overlap with your what you're doing? So what I'm going to cover on Wednesday is I'm going to go through uh, kind of an overview. I'll put up an overview of Bailcat and then I'll describe in more depth uh, everything about parallel computing. What it looks like from a hardware point of view to have multiple cores, how you program for multiple cores, and then if you want to program for multiple compute nodes, what a code looks like there. I'll kind of walk you through some specifics. I've got some sample uh, codes that you can look at and uh, compile if you have a Bailcat account. So you can get used to compile, compiling single uh, small codes, and this will all build towards the uh, stuff that I'll finish up with is installing larger scientific applications, or instead of compiling small bits of codes, you're compiling uh, large uh, large applications having hundreds of uh, individual subroutines. So parallel computing and just installing software and some usage of the machine all in two hours. I'm going to go ahead and go to the advanced page so you can kind of see some of the things that we have. Even if we don't go through, you know, examples of these, well, I don't think I will because it would be too, too, much, too much work for not, a much, not enough reward kind of thing. But we'll kind of talk about some of the things here that, that we can do. And again, this is all primarily off of the wiki. Resource requests. Um, we have a few people using this one, the AVX. That is some of the newer chipset features. We have a few uh, commercial programs in particular that need to have what's called AVX extensions. So our oldest machines won't run those, the, the CPUs. They're compiled for a newer CPU than that. Um, CUDA, we don't have any machines right now that do CUDA. CUDA is GPU programming. If you've never done CUDA programming, don't. It's a pain in the rear. I didn't say that out loud. Um, <laughs> it's, it is a pain in the rear, but it's, if, your pro, if your programs are met, will work well for it, you can really get some fast acceleration out of it. But if they're not going to work, but it's, like I said, it, it is a pain to program for. So if you're going to do that, plan on spending some time to get there. But uh, we, do have, we do have some machines that we've taken out of Baocat that we're going to put back in that have the GPUs in there. That's the plan, right, still? Okay. <laughs> We've gone back and forth on that a few times. Um, 
HRT, that's the one you'll, that's the hard run time. You can be put in either seconds or hours, minutes, seconds kind of format. InfiniBand. InfiniBand is one of those things that sounds really cool. And we've had a lot of people request InfiniBand when they don't need it. InfiniBand is a technology that lets one node talk to another node. So uh, if, if, you're, if you're running some big commercial codes, they will uh, tell you how to, how to do this, or if you're doing Dave stuff over MPI, uh, they will, that generally talks over InfiniBand. It's a very, very fast connection. That's, that was the high-speed networking piece that I was showing you on the, on the node that I pulled out there when we went through our uh, tour. So don't request that unless you need it. If you don't know if you need it or not, you probably don't. But if you think you might, ask Dave. Or send it to the email list and Dave will answer you because he's familiar with those probably about as much as anybody. This is like a dump from the, uh, the uh, documentation pages of everything that you can ask for. Most of these you're not going to be using. Ah, there we are, InfiniBand. Things you can ask for. Parallel jobs, parallel jobs are when you have uh, more than one machine talking at once, and they use, usually are talking over what's called MPI. Message passing interface, so that's how the messages get talked from one place to another. Dave, again, is going to talk a lot about that on Wednesday if you're going to be programming that. But a lot of uh, pre-compiled software that you already have will take advantage of MPI. Let's, let's one node talk to another so you can add, add or have more than one machine working on a problem at once. If you're going to be doing that, be sure to take a look at this page. We have all sorts of ways that you can ask for, uh, for jobs. MPI fill, basically you're going to try to fill up one machine as much as you can before you go to the next one. MPI spread is going to try to spread out as many crosses as you can. One at a time, two at a time, four at a time, 80 at a time, all the way down the, the line. The very important thing, if you're going to request more than one core, is, I've said this before, the memory request is per core. So if you want 80 gigs of RAM total on 20 cores, you ask for four gigs per core. You don't ask for, don't ask for 80, 80 gigs of RAM because it'll do it 80 times 20 and it won't fit on any of our machines. Um, email. We have a couple of things in your uh, in, on here that are we have a lot of people take advantage of, and I usually do this for my jobs too. And that is, I have you. You can have the schedule notify you by by email when your job starts, stops, or aborts, which is really handy to know. Is that hey, my job started. You know, I can expect it to be done in so many period of time, or it broke because, you know, it give you a reason, that kind of thing. Very handy to have that in there. I told you on the other that the reason why my uh, output file and my error file went to my home directory was because I didn't tell it that I was wanting it in the current directory. You can use the dash CWD in here. And I'm going to go, matter of fact, I'm going to go through one quick... Uh, job script, just because these are kind of good to know. I have in my BayoCAD intro folder, and again, this is world readable, so you can, if you want to come look at it and steal it, feel free. Okay. If it fits on one page. We'll less it. Okay. This I tried to document pretty well so you can see kind of what, what's going on here. So everything you put, you can, there's two ways of submitting a job. You can, uh, and actually a combination. You submit it on the command line. I, you saw when I did mine, I said qsub myhost.sh. If I wanted to give it a memory requirement, I, should, I would say, dash L memory equals 40 gigs, for instance. I can also put those inside of a file. Um, when you create a script file, anything that starts 
with the pound sign is ignored. So that's why you have all these up here. These are, these are notes for whoever's reading it. If something starts with a pound sign and then a dollar sign, SGE, our scheduler, will take and take that as a command for itself. So if I was to comment out one of these, so it said dollar sign, or sorry, pound sign, dollar sign, dash L, memory equals one G, then it would take that just as if I had typed that on the command line. Same thing for the runtime, for InfiniBand, for CUDA, all these kinds of things. So this, you feel free to take this and it, like I said, it's out on my home directory. Uh, I have a Baocat intro folder that I have a few example stuff out here. Feel free to take this and, and modify it for your own, need, own needs. It, people generally find it a lot easier to put your memory requests and time requests into a file like this because that way you don't have to remember it from time to time after you submitted it. I know it's hard to believe, but things don't always run right the first time. You know, you get error in your data, error in the way you ran it, things like that. All you have to do is change, change the part and resubmit it instead of having to figure out, okay, now, how much memory did I ask for last time and was that enough and that kind of thing? You can edit it all from, from, from in, inside here. You can name it. Instead of saying my host .sh, I could name it, you know, what host am I running on? And that'll help, that's how it'll show up both in the job queue and as your output file. And some special things in here how for how to do the email and for MPI, which let's say Dave's going to go over. So I'm doing this more to show you where to find things than to actually demonstrate them. Does that help you? I, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Last chance for questions. How um, this is in uh, my home, dire home directory under Baocat intro. So you can copy. I'm going to show you here. I'm going to put this on the screen. If you run that command, it'll copy everything from my BioKit intro to, you, to the whatever directory you're in. Um, also, if you're in like MobX term, you see up here at the top, it says Holmes Kyle Hudson. You can go there too, and then BioKit intro. And they'll, there you can see all my stuff that I have out there. So you can just copy and move it over to your own folder or whatever from there. Yes? Are you using Mobux? So you showed this, you can download files from Windows to like, can you do a free direction? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can take this whole folder as a matter of fact. Let's go up one. Like if you got some results, can you yeah. simply by mouse drag it? Yes, exactly. I'm going to take this right here, that Baokit intro folder. I'm going to Take and just drag it over here. There it goes. So if you're working with some text files, you can drag it back and Yes. Yes. Other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming, guys. Uh, I know that sticking around past 5 o'clock isn't always, in a classroom isn't always the most fun thing. So appreciate your time. and. Uh, well, if you're wanting to go on to the more advanced stuff, we'll see you with Dave here on Wednesday.